So uh, thanks uh, for uh, attending. Um, you know, uh, at least I'm not accounting. I'm not completely boring, but I'm close. So uh, I'll try and keep you awake with some anecdotes and, uh, and uh, stories, because I think that's really uh, how we learn, by example. Uh, so um, am I good? All right, so here's what we're going to cover. Uh, quick, who are we and what do we do? Um, uh, I sat with my 17-year-old daughter. She was uh, talking about me to her friend, and she said, he's in business. Say, what, what do you do, Dad? So um, I'm going to try and explain that. Um, uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about the aspirational exits. Um, so we get all excited about the really big money uh, and, and how those exits happen. Then we're going to talk about types of exits, because there's a lot more. There's many more than you probably think there are. Uh, ways of extracting money out of a company. Um, there's strategies to maximize value, which I think is the most important, the two most important parts of this, the takeaways are on the strategies and what you need to do to be ready. Uh, and then the most fun we're going to have, I hope, is at the end I've got a list of um, war stories that you know I'm going to make it interactive and you pick, and I'll tell you about a particular war story from an example. Um, so Garibaldi, is these five dudes. Um, we are a transaction team made up of not career investment bankers. Um, I was a VC for 13 years. Before that, uh, I started a, an internet 1.0 company that was called Multiactive, and then it was called Maximizer. Uh, it was Terry Huey, Joseph Huey, and me that started that company in 1994. Um, that was when you could download Mosaic uh, on a 14.4 modem for those of you that are older than a millennial. Um, and uh, uh, Andrew, uh, by the way, I went to the UBC MBA program before it was called the Sauter School. So that's really how old I am. Andrew's an SFU grad, uh, and he uh, is an electrical engineer. He worked at Hot House in his first job. And we'll talk about Hot House in a second. Uh, he was there a year and a half, and then it exited for $425 million. So um, he had a good start to his career. Uh, he then did his CFA and uh, joined us. Noah over there is the youngest of the crew. Uh, he, uh, uh, despite the lack of hair, is only 30. And um, uh, he has an experience in working in a big company, acquiring companies, which is the experience we liked. Uh, Gord was a lawyer, boo, and then uh, he uh, grew up and he went and became the CFO of a little company around here that you've heard of probably uh, called Vision Critical. And he was on that ride as the CFO from two million to 85 million uh, in sales, and then left and joined us. Actually, he was on a beach, and Angus called him and said, "We want to do some work, and I want you to work with Brent." And so he was kind of forced into it by Angus Reed. Um, Paul uh, co-founded this with me, and Paul uh, Kadrowski, some of you may know, he's uh, got about 300,000 Twitter followers. He sold his blog, which I think was the third most um, active business blog in America in 2008, and he sold it to Bloomberg. So now he talks on Bloomberg West whenever there's a technology transaction, et cetera. Uh, Paul is our connector. He's the guy that helps us get into all of the uh, people in the United States and wherever else he has relationships. So <clears throat> have a little fun here because we just moved to our new space, so I really like it. So here's where the center of the M&A technology universe is, right there. Uh, this photo was taken in 1895, and that's where the M&A universe, the future of the technology M&A universe would be. Actually, today it looks more like this. But we're in that building, and in this July, it's 120 years old. And uh, it's a really cool building. We actually sit in the bay windows in our chairs, and we can look up and down the street. It's, it's fantastic. It's noisy, though. But that's where we are, right at the, where water and, Corral come to, or, sorry, water and Cordova come together. Here's what we've done. This is why... There's some relevancy to what I'm talking about. So I was a venture capitalist up until about 2008, uh, and then I went into this role uh, as an M&A advisor. Uh, and I worked with another firm, and I did some of these transactions here, all the way up to this build direct financing here. Uh, I stepped out in October of 2012 to, we didn't even know it was going to be called Garibaldi, but Andrew and I started to work on a transaction, which was broadband TV. Um, with Sharzad, and uh, kind of speaks to how we work. We develop relationships early on, uh, have 500 cups of coffee with startup entrepreneurs in the course of a year, uh, and uh, help you with connections and whatnot. 
we don't get paid fees until you're raising $10 million or more. So that means you're a big company by that point. Um, so Sharzad raised $36 million, uh, and that's where we, you know, got our start, and that's where we collect fees. And then M&A process, um, uh, similarly, you know, we're probably not going to go out and run a process to sell you. Uh, we, we, we prefer you, be, you are going to be bought, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we'd like to see you in the 20 to $100 million enterprise value range. Uh, so um, we did a very small buy-side acquisition where we bought a company, uh, but we did, uh, you know, much bigger transactions. Uh, Aris 360 was a big one. In motion to Sierra Wireless was, was very big. Uh, Cymax, we just, it's going to be announced, I think, next week. It's $18 million. What's interesting there is that all $18 million that went into Cymax financing was by Marcus Friend, who is the Plenty of Fish owner and founder. Um, you'll see the same logos, and that's the idea. We work with a company, and then we work with them again. We work with a company, we work with them again. Um, and uh, Cymax, you'll probably see one or two or three more bubbles after this uh, uh, with further transactions. Uh, we, we like that. We like working with uh, entrepreneurs. They like us, and, and we do very good work for them, so they keep coming back, and it's a, it's a great way for us to... to uh, uh, by the way, <clears throat> it's an interesting business because it's a services business, and because we have no idea what's going to happen in the next year, I have no idea what our revenue is going to be. This does not make my wife comfortable, but she's used to it now. I've been doing this for about seven and a half years. How much money are you going to make this year? I have no idea. That's, that's what we do. So we are entrepreneurs too. We feel we're uh, very much like you. It's, uh, we're, everything's at risk. Um, and Ian uh, used to be uh, at, or still is at Launch Academy. I used to be at Launch Academy. Uh, so we felt we were a startup and that's where we actually uh, sat ourselves for two years before we went into that neat, neat space that I showed you. So here's, let's get into the exits and talk about the exits and, 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 and really what's at stake here. These are the top 10 public and private technology uh, m and uh, This is Canadian dollars and Canadian dollars at the time at which the transaction happened because the exchange rate went all over the map. Um, so you might see different numbers for some of these companies somewhere. We standardized on Canadian dollars at the time the transaction was announced. Um, so some pretty big transactions have happened. Uh, these are the uh, M&A. Uh, but you can see it drops off pretty quickly. And actually after Hot House it drops to uh, Club Penguin, which we see over here. Uh, so this is private technology companies now, just private tech companies. So they didn't go public first. Um, they were acquired, and this is pretty much where the people made their money um, uh, because there would have been very few opportunities to get out of the company before that. Uh, you can see how fast it drops into the 100 million uh, range. So you know, despite having a very robust uh, technology sector, there's a whole bunch of companies that have sold in uh, in British Columbia, in the technology sector, over the last 20 years that have sold between 10 and 30 million. And the reason for that, and the reason it was so prevalent, especially at the beginning of last decade, think of, I can think of three prominent exits in the early part of last decade where people went, ooh, wow, whoa, look, they made so much money. Active State sold for $23 million to Sophos. Class Software sold for $21 million to Active and Flickr sold to Yahoo for $25 million. And at the time, we thought, wow, that's great. That's not great, people. <laughs> uh, it, you know, in terms of, 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 of an overall, it was great for them, it was great for their shareholders. But I'm now talking in terms of the holistic picture of what's good for the BC tech industry. The reason that those companies sold so early was because they had no access to growth capital. And I don't mean VC, I mean growth equity. I mean the guys that write the 10, 15, 20 million dollar checks that we go to today to help finance companies at the later stage. So, uh, you know, Hootsuite's raised 160 million in the last couple of years. Vision Critical's raised a ton of money. Build Direct's raised a ton of money. Um, you know, doing those types of transactions actually helps our companies grow to be much larger companies and they can actually get into acquiring companies themselves. And they can go public. And they tend to be much bigger companies when they go public. So it's a good thing that we have smaller exits. But there's this sort of period of time from the middle of last decade to probably the middle of the decade we're in now, the next couple of years, where you're going to start to see much bigger exits. That's my prediction. Um, <clears throat> does everybody know what a narwhal is? I hope you do. That's the one thing you take away from this tonight. 
Um, so everybody knows what a unicorn is. Unicorn is used everywhere. I turn in CNN and they say, another unicorn has gotten a billion dollar valuation. This morning on CNBC, Zenefits, a new unicorn at four and a half billion. So um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, I thought that, um, uh, I saw that Hootsuite and, and Desire to Learn and, uh, and, and you know, we're, we're being sort of called uh, Canada's unicorns. And I said, well, we have one that has a horn and it's a narwhal. So I tweeted it out in March of 2014 that we needed to change the lexicon. Uh, and uh, what you should be aspiring to is not to be a unicorn because you're Canadian. You're aspiring to be a narwhal. It's real and it, its horn has utility to break through the ice. Okay, so that's the metaphor. Um, the four unicorns that have now become narwhals, okay, narwhals, are a Vigilon, Hootsuite, Shopify, and Slack. Now I stand here today, and yesterday a Vigilon was a narwhal. Today it fell below. Uh, it got creamed in the market today. It has been a billion a few times. So you just have to achieve a billion Canadian, uh, you know, and you're and you're a narwhal. Shopify is already there in the private market, and it's about to go public. Slack, it was well announced. He raised 120 million at a billion valuation. Then he just raised another 160 million at a two billion valuation. So he's a double narwhal. And Hootsuite, he's in Canadian dollars, depending on the day he's in our wall. Roughly, give or take. So um, we also uh, publish a list of emerging narwhals now. And uh, what I'm, I'm really happy to say is just on Monday, uh, Thomson Reuters runs a thing called PE Hub, um, which is private equity hub. So a bunch of guys in the industry like me read it. There's a PE Hub Canada, and the editor said, uh, wrote a whole article about narwhals, about how Canadian uh, uh, companies are reaching the stratosphere and they're reaching narwhal status. So I was very excited to see that, and uh, um, uh, you know, this, this is becoming part of the lexicon, so keep it going. So let's talk about the big exits. So we might have narwhals in Canada, we're gonna have bigger exits in Canada, but you know, there's those stories that are just the absolute legends, right? The companies that sell for billions and billions and billions of dollars. Uh, WhatsApp, 19 billion. I mean, honestly, people, what would you do with 19 billion that you wouldn't do with a billion? Do you know? So, but you know, a lot of the Tumblr was a billion, Oculus was over a billion, Nest was four billion or something like that. So these are companies that started, might have raised some capital, and then exited at enormous valuations for relative to what their revenue was, what their user base was, whatever metric you look at, it just doesn't make sense. So we'll get into why that happens in a minute. Um, but it's also important to know that it's not just the founders, but some of the investors along the way, and of course the employees made a lot of money uh, in these various companies. That's the classic exit that you're familiar with, M&A, ac acquisitions. But it's also worth noting that the preferred route for exits among the investor community is actually the IPO. The reason for that is because you then have the chance to make more money. You can leave your shares in there for some period of time and cash those shares out over time because you have a liquid market. When you're a private company, you are stuck. It's very hard to get the money out. When you're a public company, there's liquidity and you get a chance to, to uh, take the uh, money out over time. It's interesting, you know, um, when Google went public in 2003, there were a lot of people, a lot of people, that said 83 bucks is a ridiculous valuation for this company. Don't buy it. They're doing this stupid Dutch auction. They're giving the finger to, the, to Wall Street. Um, don't buy into this. Uh, they've got a funny share structure uh, in which the uh, common shareholders, the public shareholders, will not be able to participate. Um, so don't do it. Okay? I think uh, we all know what happened there. Um, Twitter and Facebook, uh, both had their IPOs and went down dramatically. Uh, Twitter from its first day close went all the way down from at 65, went all the way down to 26, 24. Uh, Facebook went straight down from its IPO. Uh, and then it came back. 
So there's risk to that. The IPO has risk. But generally speaking, IPOs, if you're, if you're going public as an exit and an, on an initial public offering, you have grown to a size that will support you being public, having analyst coverage, and uh, you know, having liquidity in your stock. So typically that would be, in Canada, 200 million in value to do a, an IPO on the TSX for a tech company, although ones have been done smaller. And generally speaking, a good, a good IPO in the US markets, you'd have to be worth about 500 million to be able to get enough analyst coverage. So it, it, it's a signal you know, that, that it's a decent exit, right? You've, you've created a, a company that the public will say is valued at that price. So uh, types of exits. You thought it was acquisition, but it's much more. Um, and I'm not going to get into the boring, arcane uh, legal status of all these things, but I want to point out a bunch of different ways to do this. M&A means mergers and acquisitions. Uh, it's part of the vernacular. I'm an M&A advisor. Well, I don't do very many mergers. In fact, I might not do many at all, maybe none in my career. Mergers are pretty rare because uh, there's generally no cash involved in a merger. You're bringing two companies together and you're trading share for share and you, at, a, at a relative value. Um, acquisitions are the classic. A buyer is acquiring a seller. Now, what do they acquire? If they acquire shares, it's a share sale. If they acquire assets, it's an asset sale. What's the difference? When you buy shares, I am the buyer, you are the seller, I purchase the shares of your company for a price per share, then you, as the founder, as the investor, as the shareholder, have made a capital gain, likely. If I come in and buy the assets, because the shares have been bought, you no longer own those shares, you have cash for those shares. If it's an asset sale, they, the buyer has come and said, I'll have the intellectual property, the customers, the chairs, you know, the assets, then the money goes to the company. The company doesn't disappear. In a share sale, the company disappears because all the shares are bought. In an asset sale, there's still a company. And now what, it, what, it, what does it have in it? Cash. So, <laughs> so the cash uh, needs to get out of the company. And that's a very different tax treatment because it's dividended out or it's redeemed and those have different tax rules. Share sale, capital gains. What do you all have that you all want to use as founders of a startup? You have a capital gains exemption in your lifetime of now $850,000. So you'd love to use that because that first $850,000 comes to you tax-free. Asset sale, uh-uh. So remember that when you're going forward. Um, partial sale. Uh, the tax guy always comes into the conversation, by the way. Um, a partial sale is also called a secondary. It's where you're selling shares of the company to someone for, uh, for a price. They're acquiring your shares and they're giving you cash, just like in, a, in a, an acquisition scenario. But it's only part of the company you're selling. This is popular when companies are growing and people have been in the company for a long period of time and they would like out. It's popular when there's a founder that you want to buy out because they're no longer involved in the company. Uh, Vision Critical, uh, we had up there earlier, we did a secondary sale for them. So the company, it was, it was $18.5 million, but it was $18.5 million going from these investors paying those shareholders. Okay? No money went into the company, the company's treasury. They didn't raise capital to, to spend the capital. The company got nothing out of it, zero. You understand what I'm saying? You with me? So shares bought. So the secondaries are tough to do. They're rare. Um, but in a case where a company's growing and, 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 and people have been in it for a long time, some liquidity is generally desired and you can do this secondary sale. So your new investors are coming in. They're buying in because they see the growth opportunity in the company from this point. Uh, control sale is a 51% sale. You have not bought the whole company. You've only bought enough to control it. Uh, these are popular in situations where the buyer is buying into it. Rather than invest, they'd like to control it, but they aren't 100% sure they want to own it and they want to give the entrepreneur some upside. 
Yes. You need to wait for the microphone. Forgot to remind you, microphone, please. Um, with uh, control sale, um, how, how does the board, how do board seats play into that? Okay, well, uh, it, I'll give you a war story. <laughs> um, one of the deals we did was a control sale. And the board seats are controlled, the board is controlled by the buyer. The, uh, the, the reason that, that you would consider doing this, instead of doing selling 20% of your company to an investor, you're selling 51%, is because if your company needs 20% of the company sold at that price to put money into the, to grow the company. So let's say that's $10 million is gonna go into treasury to grow the company. That's the 20%. The other 31% is secondary, effectively. It's going into the pockets of the founders. So that's why you would consider it as a founder shareholder. It's, control deals never happen when you've got VCs involved or multiple, multiple layers of investors. They happen when it's a bootstrap business, there's, there's, it's, it's a, just a few shareholders. And in that particular case, the business was growing very rapidly what was based on another technology platform. That company could turn the switch off tomorrow. So there was a great deal of risk at running it forward, so to take the money off the table today made a great deal of sense. Now, 49% of the company can still grow. And the, the way you structure these deals is down the road, two years, three years down the road, you, the, the buyer has the option to buy the rest of the shares at that market price, the then market price. Right, so it's an interesting deal. It, get, it gives you guaranteed liquidity right now and it gives you a chance to get upside. So if it all goes tomorrow, at least you got that. Now, if you had taken money from an investor and a minority investment that went into treasury, if you'd taken that 20% deal and just taken the $10 million, and it goes, you have nothing. So, interesting way to manage risk. That, that's where control sales come in. Um, and, and I already made this point, financing is basically a form of a sale of a company. Instead of, the existing shares being sold like in a secondary, you're adding to the number of shares that you're selling to the new investor, but that money goes into treasury. It doesn't go into the pockets of the investors or the, or the shareholders, rather. Okay, so financing is a form of selling the company. You're creating more shares and selling a piece of it. Um, the spin-in is a minority investment, all into treasury, right, typically for growth of the company, but it's only a 20% deal, and 20% is a magical number. It's actually 19.9 because uh, a public company doesn't have to report your losses on their earnings if they own less than 20%. So what they can do is they can structure a deal that says, I'm buying 19.9% of your company, I want to buy the rest of it under the same terms that I mentioned earlier in a control deal. They just don't have control. Because if they have a control deal, they have to report, at a 51%, they actually have to report everything on their financial statements. And then we talked about going public. That's an exit. And going public is just another form of selling, uh, of financing your company, right? So the public is now gonna own a new piece of the company. You're gonna issue stock to the public you may do a secondary, and a lot of them do, so you sell some shares going into that public offering, so it's a secondary component so you can get some liquidity. But the reason it's an exit is because now the shares are publicly traded. You can sell your shares, so it's a form of an exit, and like I talked about earlier, investors kind of prefer it, because it means you're a big company. If you can, get, if you can, if you can grow your business and do an IPO, you're a big company. You're a global player. You've, You've now got, and now you've got liquid stock as a public company. So a lot, lot of different ways to exit an investment. So this is the big secret, okay? All of you remember this fact, and I can go home right after this. Okay, I'm done. There is no secret to a big exit. There's no magic to it. You just have to build a great company. You have to. You have to build a great company that has tons of customers, has a competitive advantage, all the things that you've been ta taught probably in your other parts of this seminar. 
it, there's really no secret to it. You have to build a great company. But here's some other tips on how to be an Arwal. Um, be bought. You maximize value by being bought, not selling. You understand the difference? If you go out and hire me and say, Brent, sell my company, you are not going to make as much money as if you phone me and say, Brent, holy shit, Zillow wants to buy my company, which happened, right? So that means that now you've got inbound interest and we can leverage that into an auction. That's, that's interesting. It means that a company has found you either through a relationship that exists already or through a banker or through PR or just general knowledge about you and has said, we have a gap in our business and they can fill it. It means you have risen to the top of your category and people recognize that you are the leader in that category and you are bought. They come to you and they say, we'd like to buy you, <laughs> right? Now, there's lots of euphemisms for that. We would like to consider a strategic partnership with you. Sometimes they need to partner first. They need to do a business relationship first to be certain. And it's the crawl before you walk, before you run argument. But other times you fill a gap you clearly are you know, killing it in your category and they just come and say, we're not messing around, we'd like to buy you. So in order to do that, in order to be bought, you gotta focus on growth, you gotta focus on value creation because it's, there's more value creation than just growth. I included growth rates in there, but there's a lot of other variables, some that I even got here. It depends on your company, it depends on your space. It depends on a ton of things. There's all sorts of uh, uh, industry dynamics at play. You know, maybe there's only one obvious buyer in your, in, your, in your industry, and that's a problem. You need multiple obvious buyers, right? Or at least the way it usually works is there's a bullseye of a few companies that absolutely fit, and there's a concentric rings of maybe, maybe, you know, they'd be interested, maybe. Uh, and often what happens is you get a surprise. Way out from a concentric ring, way out here, somebody says, I want to buy you. What you don't know and what any guy like me that, that says they know is a liar. Uh, what we don't know is what's going on strategically in the conversations, in the boardrooms of all the companies that would buy you. We just don't know. And that could change day to day. It could change based on their earnings performance. It could change based on... The CEO woke up and had an idea. You don't know what the buyer's thinking. So you can guess and you can put them in these rings. You know, it's I think Google and Facebook are the most obvious buyers, but you know, here's 50 other companies that are kind of peripherally interested potentially. And that's probably, you can al always find another player that's uh, to the table there. So you have to focus on value creation and what matters to these people. What we do with you when we uh, get engaged is we talk about uh, the, the, for each individual buyer, there's a story. There's a reason that that buyer wants to buy you. And we have to create that narrative. And you have to help us create that narrative as well. And you need to understand, you need to be thinking about that all the time as you grow your business. There's a buyer out there, why would they buy me? What's the narrative? What is the story? What, what is the reason that they want to buy me? And that's what you need to think about and now answer the question that you just asked and say, they'd buy me because, and then uh, what you need to do is execute on that because. So is it because I have the strongest patent portfolio? Well then, get, you know, more patents. Is it because I have the leaders in the industry in terms of my team? Then get more people on your team that would even cement that further. Is it because I'm growing at 100% a month? <laughs> we all hope that. Um, but, but what is the reason that that particular buyer, that rationale for that buyer to buy you? And it gets much more nuanced than that. Each individual buyer has a much more nuanced reason to buy you. And you need to be thinking about that always. And then answering their, that, that question of, of why they would buy you by focusing on those things that would create value. 
uh, and then let people know. That's the most important thing that so many, especially Canadian companies, fail to do. You gotta scream it from the rooftops. You've gotta let people know that you are the leader in the category. You gotta let people know that you're growing at an insane rate. You gotta let people know that you just hired the best and smartest person that you could possibly do for your genomics company. You know what I'm saying? Like you've gotta let people know. There has to be PR, there has to be concerted. You have to have an email list of all of the corporate development people at all the buyers that you talked about, that, we, that we've, we've identified. And you need to email them your press releases. Right? You need to make sure they're on your mailing list. They need to know about you. You need to go to the conferences or the trade shows and you need to go to the buyer's booth and you need to talk to somebody there and say, I'm killing it. Right? You should be working with me or I'm crushing you or whatever the case may be. Right? Let them know. Uh, the last point here is that buyers often come from companies that you know well, you know, partners, customers, suppliers. That's often where it happens. Here's, in, when you go to sell a company, which we don't like to do, uh, but we, we're starting from scratch. There is no inbound interest. We do that bullseye, concentric ring. We go through each potential buyer that they've identified, that we've identified. We, we develop that rationale for each buyer. And then I ask the question, does anybody in that business that's right in the middle of that concentric ring, does anybody in that business know who you are? Do you have a reference at Intel? Do they know? Does somebody at Intel know that you do this technology? If the answer is no, then guys like us are going to phone the corp dev guy, guy I use euphemistically for female and male, by the way. We're going to phone the corp dev person. And we're going to say, I have a company to, that I'm selling, and they do this. And the first question they're going to ask, because they get inundated with requests, first question is, who in my business do I talk to about this company? And if it's like, well, nah, well, you wouldn't really know it yet, then there's zero chance you're going to get bought by that company. Zero. They, they have to know about you. Right? So the best way to do that is to develop relationships with these companies. Partnerships, you know... Uh, conversations, uh, um, uh, in, uh, distribution relationships, whatever it is. You've got to come up with a business reason that that company wants to know about you. And if it's competitive, then you've got to let them know, like I said, poke them in the eye with, with how you're doing relative to them. Question for you. Can you explain the creating a new category point? It's, a, it's an old marketing trick. If... Um, uh, if, you're, if you're not leading in the category, make up a new category. Right? So, it, you know, I'm the leader in uh, the, uh, the, the, I don't know, like uh, the, I'm the Canadian leader in this, like geography, or I'm the leader of, uh, 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 the specific slice of the market that you're going after. You, you have to be really creative with this, but you've got to create the category and lead the category. Um, uh, it's a perception thing. You're really trying to create the perception that you're out in front. If you say, I'm an ERP software company, then there's SAP and Oracle. and it, like You have to make it a much finer slice and say you're leading. Now, it's also that you're completely disruptive and you actually are creating a new category. There's something completely different about what you do. That would be preferable instead of, you know, slicing <laughs> a marketing category. So <clears throat> let's talk about value and valuation. Okay, so now we've got the interest of a buyer. We've, we've, we've got an inbound offer. Uh, and, and sorry, not offer, an inbound, inbound interest. Interest means they're signing an NDA and they'd like to learn more about your company. But you haven't talked price yet, because you never do, because you don't want to scare them, because you're saying, I want to be bought for 50 million. You say, oh, shit, if I say 50 million, they might go away. So you haven't talked price 99 times out of 100. 
But they're under NDA, they say they're interested, they're getting information from you. By the way, this is in the war stories camp again, you only give information prior to a written letter of intent with all of the parameters of the transaction written in gory detail in an LOI, you only give them enough information to get them there. The number of times I have stopped an entrepreneur from handing the keys to his entire company over before he, he or she even has uh, discussed the value, is it's crazy. You, customer lists and you know, uh, uh, information about the technology that is really the, the secret sauce. Like, all they need to know is high level financials, uh, you know, product description, product roadmap, but at a general high level, your capitalization table, which means all of your investors and shareholders and everything else all written out, so they understand how, you, how your company is uh, put together, your trailing financials and your future forecast, your, your financial model, but at a high level. You don't need to get down to, and you don't give them their, your employees, that was another one. It included in the financial model, sent over after just signing an NDA but not discussing price, was every single employee's name and what they were paid. Right, so buyers are liars. Okay, for, that's another thing we're gonna walk out of here with. Buyers are liars. They're gonna say they wanna buy your company. What they're really after is your people. Okay, so if you hand them the entire list <laughs> of names and salaries, they're gonna phone up and say, I'm gonna pay you 20% more, come join my company. So do not give them, even under NDA, you, you, you wait until you've got an LOI before you do what's called confirmatory due diligence. And under confirmatory due diligence, after you've signed the LOI and you understand what the deal is, and you've started the process of writing the legal agreements to purchase the company, you can start to reveal, you can have conversations with customers, you can reveal the employee list, uh, the customer list, the secret sauce to your technology, the details of how you build your technology, all of the dirty secrets of your company with the most important secrets of your company coming as long as you can hold off until close. The day before, two days before, three days before, the buyer's gonna scream, they're gonna be like, yeah, I have to see this. But you, have, you wait and wait and wait till you're sure this deal's gonna get done before you reveal everything. Okay, so we're under NDA, we haven't talked price, we're gonna talk value. You've given them enough information to give you a, an estimate of value. They always say in an LOI, subject to due diligence, right? So the price is gonna be the price. You wanna get it at least close enough so that they don't come back after you sign the LOI and say, actually, we've learned this, this, and this, and we're lowering our price. You have to give them a little bit of the warts and a little bit of everything else so that they give you an, an accurate perspective of, of value. Financial value is this blue box is where VCs and private equity guys and growth equity guys will value your company, okay? Because the financial value of your company is based on the metrics that you can show them that are happening in your business, all right? How, how many users do I have? How fast is that growing? How, what's my EBITDA, or if you don't have it, what's my revenue? What multiples of revenue? Uh, what are my gross margins relative to my uh, peers? Uh, you know, what are my growth rates? Where do I stand? Am I the leader in the category? Uh, what, kind of, what kind of other things do I have that can be analyzed and crunched and turned into a comparison to other companies, uh, discounted cash flow, whatever way you want to come about it and come up with my financial value. Um, the reason that VCs only pay you financial value is because they're financial people. They're only interested in making money. They are not interested in any of these things until, of course, they've invested and then they're very interested in these things because that drives the exit. So the exit is driven, the good exit, the, the price you want is driven by these two boxes. The synergistic value is absolutely specific to the company that's buying you and, you know, we can cut the finance team out of here. Those costs are gonna go. We're overlapping on distribution. Those are gonna go. Uh, it's, it's things that you can, uh, or, or on the positive side, that's the cost synergies, on the revenue synergies, it's once we plug 
your software into our sales team because you don't have a direct sales force. This thing's going to explode. There's going to be so much money made by, by my company with your software that you can't make because you don't have a direct sales force. That kind of a synergy. So there's the cost synergies and the revenue synergies. Somewhere, in a, somewhere at Facebook, somewhere, there was a, a, a junior analyst who works till 2 in the morning who had to come up with that for WhatsApp. We're paying $19 billion, so how am I going to explain this financially? Every single transaction has to have, on the buyer side, a, a defense of the price they're paying. Now, once they come up with that, and they can think of all the things that are going to happen down the road, and they've discounted it back, and they've done all that math on the synergistic value, they will not, the reason I made this a shorter bar is because the synergistic value is actually probably halfway up there, but they never pay you for all of it, because why would they? Right? They can't pay you for all the synergistic value because that would make no sense. They want to pay you for maybe for some of it, preferably none, but for some of it, so then they can realize it. They can realize that value after they buy you. Okay, so you fight over synergistic value. So what we do as bankers is we, they don't tell us what they're thinking. We have to dream it up. And then we go and we present it to them. We say, we think you're going to do this, and we think you're going to do this, and so we'd like to capture 50% of that. And we start negotiating from there. The strategic value is the no idea how much <laughs> uh, strategic value is worth. Um, it is really comes down to, um, is there somebody else at the table? Is there somebody that is a threat to that buyer that is going to buy this company and they don't want it in the hands of the other buyer? That's where WhatsApp got ridiculous. That's where Waze got ridiculous. That's where Nest got ridiculous. Ridiculous values typically are because there's an immense strategic value put on, the, on, on owning the company and its technology and or its people or its IP or whatever it is. In a conceptual sale um, where there are no financial metrics because there's no Nothing's happened yet. Uh, the whole thing is green. <laughs> um, and so uh, we have a conceptual sale process underway right now. Um, the company's been around 12 years. It's spent $25 million building its technology and its processes. It's got uh, two or three working final products. And a large company with 10 billion in revenue came and said, we're going to buy you. And then they said, send us your materials and your revenue and everything else. And we said, there isn't any. And then they said, well, how are we going to define how much we buy you for? And we said, we'll get back to you. And we've, we've been running around talking to all the other obvious buyers as fast as we can just to get another one to the table. And getting another one to the table, we have two that look like they will be, causes there to be a discussion on what the value is. Otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> so we're basically saying it's worth the money that's gone into it, maybe a little bit more. The investors would like to get a return. But there's, it's completely conceptual. Uh, Brent, could you explain at what point negotiations become exclusive? Because as long as there's somebody else at the table, they must be non-exclusive. We're about to get into that. Okay. Thanks for being my plant, Rudy. Ah, look, strategies for maximizing value at the deal. <laughs> um, so the, the, the number one way to, to, to create value and extract strategic value, I've mentioned, get that competitive tension going. Um, it has to be managed carefully. So now to answer your question specifically, um, this is the very, very careful uh, uh, negotiation. It, it never happens that that three companies decide on the same day that they want to buy you, right? It happens, you're, you're trying to push one, delay another, um, all sorts of tactics. Oh, uh, I can't get back to my board member, he's on vacation. 
Uh, can I get back to you next week? You do all of these things to try and line everybody up within the same time frame for their offer, for their proposal. And often you get one, and then you have to go with that one, you have to go to the others that are interested and say, I have a proposal, I have an indication of interest, I need you guys to step up and give that indication of interest. Now, small advertisement for someone like me. This is what we do for a living, right? And if you, there are many entrepreneurs that uh, are very, very smart people that love to negotiate and can't let go. And so they tend not to hire somebody like me and they try and do it all themselves. And very rarely, they can. But most often, they get so caught up in doing all this and, and running the deal and negotiating and everything else, they forget to run the business. So that can be the deal killer. In business, you're in, the, you're in a, you're a six-month process from the time you first talk to a, a buyer to the time you actually get a check, on average, six months. That's two full quarters. That's plenty of time to have your business go in the tank if you're not paying attention to it. And that kills your deal. So not only do you not have your deal, you wasted all that time and your business sucks. So you need to have a team. If you're a bigger company, you've got a board, you get, the board can help you. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. You've got a good CFO that's not, that has some uh, uh, transaction experience, has been you know, in my role before, that helps. Don't try and do it by yourself. Get help. Um, so, Rudy, to your question about exclusivity, the LOI is the exclusivity point. You can get an indication of interest in writing that says, like uh, another war story. Uh, got a call one summer, a couple summers ago, and uh, it was a referral. Hey, this entrepreneur's got an, um, an inbound interest. I phoned him. I left him a message. I said, I'd love to talk to you about this potential buyer. He didn't phone me back, didn't phone me back, didn't phone me back. Two weeks later, he phoned me back and said, so I'm just about to sign this thing, and uh, I thought I'd give you a call. I said, what thing? Can you send it over? Uh, so we danced around NDA, and I said, I'll sign an NDA, just send it over. He was about to sign an indication of interest from a buyer, a, a public company in, in the US, that said, we want to buy your company, I'm paraphrasing, uh, we don't know the value. Let's go exclusive for 120 days. We'll do the research and we'll find out. And I said, that is like, whoa, what are you doing? Do not sign that. That's crazy. That afternoon, without being signed up officially as an advisor, I was on the phone to the CEO of the company. And I said, uh, we're not signing this. Tell me what information you need to be able to give us an indication of value and a, and a much more detailed LOI, and then we'll go exclusive. And so that's what happened. We then, of course, ran around and talked to five other buyers to try and extract value. We got another one to the table, and it pushed this guy's um, uh, ideas of value up and made some of the terms better. But you don't go exclusive until you got that full set of terms that you're happy with, that your board's happy with, that your investors are happy with. And you sign the LOI, you sign a form of exclusivity, of course you try and make it as short as possible because that puts the pressure on them on the back end. As you're going through this, the, you know, if the deal's not closing, they're taking too long in their diligence, you're coming up to that date in which the exclusivity expires. If you had other people at the table, this is gonna drive things in your favor because they're gonna first come to you and say, can we extend the exclusivity? And you go, no, no. <laughs> and then they're gonna say, well, we don't have all the information and you, they're gonna make up excuses as to why you have delayed them. And then they're gonna realize that they've only got a certain number of days and they actually start to move on some of the terms that you've been negotiating during the exclusivity. So that's, exclusivity is very important because it maintains the tension, having it short. If, they, if you give them 120 days and all the time, buyers are gonna take their time. Hey, we got an exclusivity. And by the way, they could go under exclusivity with you. You are forced to reveal any inbound emails or phone calls from any other buyer to them under the terms of the exclusivity, but it's not a two-way street. They could be out buying your competitor, right? So time kills deals. Do not take a long time. <clears throat> 
so how do you be prepared? How do you get ready? How do you, from the day one where you guys are today, you can be ready. You can start to get prepared uh, for an exit. Uh, that exit could be 12 years from now. But the way you do that is you have the technology today to get a process in place to get every single document, NDA signed, employment contracts, offer letters, uh, customer contracts, everything into an organized state. Signed NDAs, signed employment contracts, all of it. Stick it in a folder. You have it, that's your repository, that's where you go and find it when you need it. Do not have 23,000 unread emails in your inbox, plus all the ones you've read, and somewhere in there is the attachment for the Google contract that defines your revenue, somewhere. Good luck in searching that for Google, et cetera, and finding the attachment that was the one that was signed, and oh shit, I can't find it, obviously happened, right? So it's a pain for you as entrepreneurs with 9,000 things to do to get a process that is as pedantic as take signed NDA, put in folder, okay? but it will make your life so much easier on exit because if you can't find those documents, if you can't find the signed contracts, it will come back to haunt you in a, in a big way. You've got to get a controller as soon as you've got revenue. You've got to have an accounting system as soon as you've got revenue. Um, you have to put in controls financially on expenses anyway, you have to do budgets anyway, so why not get an accounting system before you have revenue? That's okay, it's just expenses, but it's an accounting system. And the, 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 you start with the simple ones, Zero and Wave and you know, QuickBooks Online and all that, and you graduate over time to, to more complex accounting systems. Hire a VP Finance or a CFO when you go to one of those more complex um, uh, systems, and when you start getting audited. There, the question always comes up, do I need to be audited? If you are going to be invested in by a VC, you do not have to be audited when they invest, but you will be audited every year thereafter. That'll be a condition of the, of the investment. If you take debt from any source, you will have to be audited from that point forward. Um, if you get bought, I can think of one instance in all the things that I showed you there in which the company was unaudited um, but was bought and it was because they hadn't hit revenue yet. And the buyer said, that's okay, I can see everything. Show me everything, your bank account, everything in the confirmatory due diligence and they could see everything. But an audit is a stamp of approval that is absolutely required in 90% of the deals for you to be bought by a public company for you to be bought by a private equity fund, for you to be bought even by a company that is thinking of going public in the short term, you need to have an audit. Because remember the previous slide, losing deal momentum? If you're trying to do an audit, which takes an enormous amount of time and a couple of months of work while you're trying to close a deal, you risk losing the deal. Now, audits are expensive and time consuming, but some of the other the audit firms here are, that aren't named PwC, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, or KPMG can do a perfectly good job for one third the price of those guys. And those would be Smythe Ratcliffe, BDO, Grant Thornton, right? So start with them and work your way up. you can probably get it done for 10,000 bucks, right? Um, which is cheap compared to what PwC typically charges. Have a good financial forecast model and build it with assumptions, like defensible assumptions. 
What does that mean? That means you've got data somewhere in the KPIs that you track that can, can defend the directionality of your assumptions. We're going to have X thousand users, okay, in, you know, next year. Based on what? Right? Based on some growth rate that you've got existing, based on the last couple of months, find a trend. Right? Find a trend. The trend is your friend. Build assumptions off of it. Believable assumptions will lead to the credibility in the buyer's eyes and in the investor's eyes, by the way, if you're going for venture capital. Um, you have to be able to show your financial forecast that you built two years ago, actually, and what happened and track it against what actually happened. Uh, there was a great LinkedIn presentation that, uh, uh, oh, shoot, what's her name? Eileen or Elaine? Uh, she was one of the early people at LinkedIn, and then she was on the board. And she showed the forecasted that she presented to the VCs, uh, that the senior management team presented to the VCs. Here's the forecast that we said in you know, 2003, and here's actual, and they beat it. Now, I might need, I've seen 10,000 business plans and 10,000 financial forecasts as a VC and as a as an, uh, an M&A advisor, that's rare. <laughs> the hockey stick getting beat, that is very rare. So have, but you have to be able to show what happened, you know, why you didn't meet it, uh, you know, what was going on in the, in the data. Your, your financial model has to be very robust and the assumptions have to be robust. We had a deal in which a local software company was being purchased by a large multinational company and we got called when there were two buyers at the table and we came running in to run the process. We didn't have time to get to know the company. We didn't have time to look at all of the materials. In fact, we were shoveling things into the data room as fast as we could with the CFO who was also new to the company. And we looked at the financial model and we said, wait a second, this is the forecast? Uh, and we went back to the CEO and said, this forecast is like very telling because there's zeros at the end of the forecast uh, for sales in all the years going out. And by the way, I can do a straight line calculation of your costs going up at exactly the same rate as your revenue. This is, what is this? Oh, uh, well, we didn't have time to do a, a financial model, so I just estimated it. I said, you're kidding me. Right? Where are the assumptions in this model? Where's the, this looked like a model built by a first year commerce student. And sorry, apologies to all you commerce students. Um, it, was, it was just, there were no assumptions. There was no model. There was, there was nothing. It was just a set of projections built on percentages of revenue. The, I was in the room, the head of the diligence process from this European country looked at him and said, this process is ending until you can show me the assumptions in your model because we're buying you for strategic value. We're also buying you because you're projecting that you're gonna make this growth over the next three years and in an industry that isn't growing. This is why we're buying you. Where are the assumptions? And a month later, when, after we tried to back and reverse engineer and talk to every one of his sales guys and try to figure it all out, the deal blew up, gone. Many tens of millions of dollars. Company still exists, company's doing okay, but that deal walked away because they hadn't built a financial model based on assumptions. So be ready for that. Okay, so this is the war stories part. Um, this is um, my list of stories I can tell. So, you know, what is the subject and what's my thinking on the subject? Um, and I can tell you war stories about any of these things and, and more. Um, the thing about M&A that I like is that every single deal is different. There are infinite ways to structure a deal. And creativity is really important in getting the deal to work for both sides, but mainly for the seller in my, actually we do buy side work too. So there's, you have to be creative to get a deal done. You have to think of different ways to be able to skin the cat. 
And then you have to get the lawyers involved to say, I said we could do this. And the lawyers go, no, you can't. And then we have to think of another way. But it's, 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 there's just so many different things we can talk about. You had a question? Yeah, could you just maybe um, flush out a bit more what assumptions you want to build the financial model on? So the best financial models, and by the way, we've got two of the best modelers, I think, uh, Noah and our analyst, Chris, are just fantastic modelers. You want to, uh, st I want to have one page in the spreadsheet that has all the key assumptions, and those assumptions, every time I change one of those assumptions, with, with nice notes beside as to what it means, every time I change one of those, the entire model updates, right? So I need your, unit, your units, your, your users, your, your metrics that you drive your business in the assumptions. I need, it's basically your KPIs. It's churn, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the difference uh, in, the, in the rate of growth of customer acquisition based on customer acquisition cost. It's uh, different channels have different customer acquisition costs and different rates at which they uh, acquire customers for you. Um, and then, that's all the, the myriad of, of revenue assumptions. Then you gotta have your cost of goods assumptions, your gross margins, you know, which, you know, is there gonna be services required on X number of, of deals? And is it, sometimes you have to go small, medium, big because it gets too complicated. Uh, then you got your expense assumptions. Your expense assumptions are actually easier to do than your revenue assumptions because you, you say, I'm gonna need uh, X number of customer support uh, for every number of customers I have to support. And so you can change that ratio. Uh, you've gotta have, uh, you know, your R&D team uh, is a well thought out project plan for, that ties to your roadmap for the next two years. Beyond that, it's a guess. Everything's a guess after two years, but well thought out in terms of your, your, your technology team. But then you gotta think realistically, if this business is growing, I'm not gonna keep growing my R&D team, right? So there's gonna be a scale benefit there. I've gotta be able to see the scale benefits. I gotta be able to see the, the, uh, the economics of your business working. Um, I gotta be see, see what can I tweak to change your gross margins? Where can I get more efficiency in your business? Um, all of that is laid out in assumptions. It's really hard to build a good model. You, you can start with just basic assumptions and building out your next couple of years and just have it so that it's all plugged in so I can change those basic assumptions and I can see what happens. But I would hire a part-time CFO or a controller or somebody that's done financial forecasting and have them build it. And then you've got a very valuable forecasting tool for yourself. The interesting thing about forecasting, this goes back to 1992 and Rafi Amit, my professor in finance at UBC, he's now at Wharton, pointing his finger saying, you do a business plan, you do a financial forecast because it forces you to think about your business at every detail of your business. And it does. You go, oh God, this is gonna take so much time, it's gonna be so much hard work. What you're doing is you're thinking of every single aspect of your business as you build it, right? And that's why it's important to do it. So, all right, do I get to pick one? Uh, all right, earnouts, let's start with that. Um, earnouts are the dirty, dirty, dirty part of M&A. Uh, typically, if I could give it over $100 million in value, one in 10 deals have earnouts. Under 100 million, so let's say between 25 and 100 million, 50% have earnouts. Under 25 million, 90% have earnouts. And the reason for that is quite simple. The business is at a very different stage of maturity and there's risk in your forecast. If you're a $100 million business, you've been at it for a while, you've grown a very, very big business, and you've got all sorts of people and you know, audits and everything, you're a big business. The chances of repeatability of your business are high. And the chances that you're gonna hit your forecast based on what you've done in your last three years and how you've done against budget are pretty reasonable. So there's no need to build in 
I'm going to buy your company for the entire price of your company. I'm going to give you that cash, and then I'm going to, I'm going to benefit from here on. Thank you very much. When you're a $5 million a year company, you're not a global player. You're small. You're emerging. You're, you're growing your business. You might be in a high growth rate. Your forecast is, could be any one of these things. And there's a great deal of risk to the buyer as to what's going to happen next. So they're saying, I'll buy you for a total value, but you're going to earn half of that value or a quarter of that value in an earnout over the next year, two years, three years, based on certain metrics. Revenue, EBITDA, users, those are the metrics. The problem with earnouts is they get horribly complex. Uh, the problem with earnouts is, are you being bought and subsumed into the company? And if you're being subsumed into the company, how do you have any control over that? How do you have control over your revenue? How do you have control over your costs? If you're being integrated right in to another business unit in the company. It, earnouts only work if they basically buy you and leave you alone with some help, some resources. But they basically leave your operating unit alone to allow you to achieve the earnouts. It makes no sense if they grab you, stuff you into a new <laughs> uh, section of, of the existing company, integrate you fully, and then say, well, you didn't hit your numbers. Well, you had no control over that. So it's an interesting, messy, ugly reality of the sub $25 million deal. And uh, uh, that is where you know, M&A advisors um, uh, earn their fees, is getting you out of earnouts, getting you more money now. Uh, you know, the terms of the deal as opposed to, I mean, we also earn our fee by making you more money at the, at the overall value. But often it comes down to these mechanics so we had uh, a deal in which there was one proposal on the table from one company that was going to buy the company for $23 million, and they were going to pay the shareholders $16 million at close, and there's going to be $7 million in earnout over the next two years. We got the other buyer to the table, and we told the other buyer that what we didn't like about the other deal, it's really bad form to tell the details of a confidential term sheet, so you can't do that. But you can say, we don't like the, about the other deal, is it has an earnout. If you can get rid of an earnout and give us a price, a fair price, and pay it to us at close, subject to diligence, we'll go with you. So they submitted an offer for $21 million with no earnout. So then we turned over here and we said, guys, we got an offer, it has no earnout. We're going to take it unless you put your best foot forward here. So they were very upset. <laughs> they called me names. And then they came back two days later and said, 23 million, no earn out. So I went back <laughs> to the other guy. And I said, thanks for not having the earn out, but we're going to go with the other guy because he got a better price. And you'd have to really sharpen your pencil here. So this buyer said, in US dollars, I'm going to give you 23 million. And what happened in the process of doing this was the Canadian dollar started to do this. So I went back to the Canadian buyer and I said, yeah, your deal every day is getting more, is getting better than yours because it's in US dollars. So I got called a few more names and then they said, all right, US dollars. And so we went back to the board and we said, okay, here's the two offers, which one do you like? And by the way, the board was completely conflicted. All five of them had conflicts, even the CEO. Because in the one case, the CEO was going to be hired by the buyer. And in the other case, they already said in the LOI, the CEO will not be part of the company. So now he's conflicted. <laughs> he, can't, he can't. So all five board members are conflicted. So we kind of went, well, we put on our referee shirt. And we sort of said, OK, I think we think this deal offers more value. and." You know, it's a Canadian company, and the integration will probably go better, and there's no earnout. So that, that was the deal we took. So if you have a competition, you can get better terms. Think about the difference in the transaction. They were handed 23 million US at close. 
the shareholders versus what was 16 million at close, and then they'd have a chance at getting 7 million over the next two years. So paying us a fee seemed like that was a good, you know, we'd, we'd earned our fee, so to speak. So earnouts are ugly. You try and get rid of them as best you can. If you do have an earnout, you have to keep it as simple as possible. We just did another deal with an earnout, and the 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 it it got complicated, and it was the 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 buyer wasn't. We didn't have pressure from another buyer. The buyer was adamant that that they said this was their forecast, and they needed to hit it. And to be truthful, in this case, our seller, our client, had actually put too aggressive a forecast in front of them. We warned them. We said, you do that, they're going to make you earn that. Oh, no, I'm going to do that. I'm going to hit those numbers. And then when it comes back at the entrepreneur, all right, hit the numbers and you'll get paid. Whoa, wait a minute. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean those numbers. So, again, the forecast is important. Uh, so in this situation, we didn't have as, uh, the dynamic that we had in the other one. So what we said was, okay. He can achieve those numbers on revenue over the next two years, but only if he has the resources at his disposal because he was going to raise money, and that's when this buyer came in. So you have to provide the budgeted expenses, the resources, to allow this entrepreneur to hit his. If you don't, he gets paid all of his earnout. So that's the. The flip side to the deal is if the company doesn't honor their commitment to actually invest in this and, and allow him to earn his earnout, he's just going to get his earnout. Well, as of today, they're not doing their part, so he's probably just going to get paid his earnout. So you got to put tricks in there that, uh, and, and, and balances to make sure that it's fair to the entrepreneur. If they're not going to provide the resources to allow him to hit it, then can't do it. Is there a question? What happens with um, uh, the earnout? They they don't hit their targets. Do they just lose their their portion? There's a you just don't get buy? it. So, um, uh, like I said, there's a thousand ways to do this, but I'll give you a couple examples. One that's publicly been told, which is Club Penguin. Club Penguin got bought for 700 million, but it was 350 million at close and 350 million over two years in 275 million dollar chunks based on the metrics they had to hit. And they didn't get any of it. So it was a $350 million deal. They did not hit their metrics in the first year. Therefore, they, they had a catch-up clause where if they actually outperformed in the second year, they could catch up and get the earnout paid. They didn't hit it. So zero. So typically what you do is you structure some sort of a cliff. So uh, if you're going to, you, it's not dollar for dollar on the earnout. So let's say, for example, that you had to do $10 million in sales in year one to get your earnout, 100% of your, your, your year one earnout. So let's say that was a million dollars. You're going to get paid a million dollars to achieve 10, okay? What they would do is they would say, starting at $8 million in revenue or $9 million in revenue, whatever the number is, at that point you start earning your earnout, right? So if you earn below that, you're going to get zero. But at that point, you're going to start to earn your earnout, and it goes linear from there, right? So that's a typical way to do it. There's a there's a minimum threshold that you have to hit to earn anything, and then you get get it from there. And there's catch up clauses in the second year, and there's all sorts of different things that you put in. But like I said, you <laughs> when you're having that conversation, it's difficult. You'd rather just not have one. You'd rather just be paid money for your business today. The reason earnouts end up in, in the deals actually, quite honestly, is because the entrepreneur says, I wanted $15 million for this business. It's worth $15 million. And the, they're prepared to give you a cash for the whole company today of 10. And so then the earnout discussion comes in. Okay, you want 15, we'll pay you, we'll pay you 10 today, you can get the other five. But you have to earn it. So sometimes it's just better to take the 10, or say 11. <laughs> yeah. Hi, you just explained it about advisors, why it makes sense to hire them. Uh, but the question is regarding the payment, payment to advisors. Uh, do they get 
their payment upfront uh, in any case or only when uh, the due is uh, due happens. And the second se second question is, what's the general idea of the payment? So uh, when you hire somebody like me, you, uh, you typically pay something up front because there's no free option. We don't want to work for free and you decide, eh, I don't want to do this deal. And we put a whole bunch of work in. But, um, but it's typically less than what you pay up front and it's usually in monthly installments ends up either being tucked into the success fee or it's like less than 10% of what the success fee would be. So it's, it's nominal in the context of the whole fee. So if the process goes along, for a few months and you paid us for a few months and then it doesn't work out, you didn't like the deal, we couldn't get the deal, whatever it is, there's a termination, you don't get that money back. But if the, the deal happens, then you sometimes, guys like us, tuck it into the success fee, others, it's additive, it's, they're kind of all over the map. But it's a success fee basis, it's a percentage of the deal, it's like a commission. Um, that's how we work, which is why, back to the very first comment I made about my wife not, you know, not knowing how much money I'm gonna make, that's exactly why. I have no idea. I don't know what percentages, I don't know how big the companies are gonna be, I don't know what the sale price is gonna be, and I don't know if we're gonna get it. So that's how we work. There's an increasing trend where entrepreneurs are getting partial cash outs in their Series A or Series Bs. How is that affecting the M&A down the line for you? So that's secondary. I talked about that earlier. Um, uh, Series A, I doubt it. Uh, I've, I was a VC, Series A, early stage VC, and there's a very, very, very strong mantra amongst the VC community, which is last in, first out. Um, we didn't even want to pay off debt, let alone you know, pay, pay an entrepreneur or something. Um, so I doubt that it's Series A, but in the later rounds, generally speaking, there is some secondary. And I'll give you some logic behind that. So, You've operated the company for eight to 10 years. You're, you're, you're a 10 year overnight success. Uh, suddenly you're big, you're 50 million in revenue. You've got you know, 150 employees uh, and you're going out to raise you know, a $30 million round to really accelerate your growth internationally. You have worked for 10 years on founder's shares, on a founder's salary, right? Uh, you have put so much sweat equity into this thing and when you started it, you were all about risk. It's like, yep, I'm rolling the dice here. Let's see how this turns out. You're all about risk. You're taking a gigantic risk. And then you get to 50 million in sales and you look at the paper value of your shares, which are, this, we're gonna do this round at 200 million. And you go, wait a second. I've got, you know, I don't know, you're a founder, I've got, $30 million on paper here. Oh shit, I don't, want, I don't want that to be put at risk. So the decisions you start to make as a CEO or as a founding management team or as the CTO, your decisions become about managing that paper value to get it to liquidity. And you don't take as much risk. So the investor comes in and says, all right, I'm gonna give you 30 million. We're gonna go after this, but I want you to go after it like the day you started the company. So here's five million bucks in a secondary, or 10 million bucks in a secondary, and you have now de-risked the whole thing. I want you to step on the gas and go for it. So there's logic to that partial sale. Now, affecting the exit at the end, not really. I mean, Andrew Mason selling a whole ton of his stock six months before Groupon went public and then Groupon tanked, that looks bad. Um, uh, but, you know, the founders of Hootsuite taking money off the table as this thing grows to an our wall, it's still growing like crazy. They're the, the fastest growing company in terms of employees. Uh, so it's still growing. Uh, that's okay. It shouldn't affect the exit one iota. Because it, it's about you, the entrepreneur, when you're the early stage, at the early stages, because you're, it's, it's in your head, it's your passion, it's everything else. And at a certain scale of your business, it's not about you anymore, right? You're replaceable. The business itself has got mass and it's growing and it's got uh, reputation and it's got customers and it's got all that stuff. So, you know, early on, it's difficult to, to, to give you money off the table. Later on, it's okay. 
Let me see. Unreasonable value expectation. Let's talk about that. There is never in my uh, uh, career in either venture capital or this been an entrepreneur that goes, I'm not worth as much as you think I'm worth. So uh, the game for us, the really tricky game for us in getting hired when you say, I want to raise money and I want to do it at certain valuation. I want to raise money, I want to be at comparable valuations to my peers in the US. I want to sell or, or I want to you know, be bought because I've got this inbound offer and I want you to drive the value higher because I don't like this offer. I don't like this price, it doesn't make any sense. The, if you have unreasonable value expectations, if you're driving a, the, the highest possible price and that's what matters, you can get the wrong buyer, you can get the wrong investors if it's that case, because you're just trying to get value. You're not understanding who the partner is. You're gonna get earnouts. Or in the case of investment, you're gonna get ridiculous terms in your preferred shares. They'll give you the number, but they're gonna bury all sorts of financial uh, stuff in there that benefits them. So, the other thing is that I think of a particular entrepreneur um, and uh, he, he reads about companies 10 times his size getting six or seven times revenue on, a, on, a, on, a, on an investment round or on an exit and he turns to us and says, this is what I'm worth. And so there's a law of small numbers. <laughs> and the law of small numbers is if you're under $10 million in revenue, you don't matter. You are irrelevant on the global scale. You cannot argue to an investor or a buyer that you're comparable, you are comparable to these other companies that are much bigger than you. Well, Google's trading at five times revenue. I am like Google, I should be trading at five, you should get me five times revenue. Okay, that does not make sense at all. When, when I hear angel investors and VCs arguing in the sub 10 million value level, they, they, you know, first of all, the investors will go justify your valuation. And then the, 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 the entrepreneur says, well, I'm just like so-and-so. So, -and -so. so they, that's all a big waste of hot air. It's ridiculous. The investor should be sophisticated enough to know that there's no point. There's no way you can justify your valuation. Sub 10 million. What you can do is you can, on an investment round, is just do simple series A math, which is somebody's gonna invest in your company at an angel round, they're gonna buy 10 to 15% total, the angel round, and when it's a VC round, they're gonna buy 25 to 33% of your company. The more money you raise, the higher your valuation. Ta-da, that's it. They're never gonna buy 50% of your company at series A and they sure as heck don't want to buy five. So there's a range of ownership that angels and VCs expect. And so if you go out and say, I'm gonna raise 250,000, you're gonna have a low valuation. If you're gonna go out and raise a million dollars, you're gonna have a higher valuation. That's the way it works when you can't do any sort of comparables to anybody else. There's no justification for it. There's, a, <laughs> there's no way to say I'm worth that. It's just, that's what I'm raising. This is what I'm prepared to sell my company for the risk. That's what you typically take. If somebody comes to you and says, I'll give you $500,000 and I want 60% of your company, would you take it? No, and they shouldn't even offer that. Anybody that comes to you at, at, at the earliest stage that you're at and says, I want control of your company, tell them to go get stuffed. It's 10 to 15% for angels, period. And it's 25 to 33% for VCs. So if you're gonna raise $5 million, you're worth 13 to 15 million. Right? If you're gonna raise $3 million, you're worth seven, eight million. <laughs> right? That's the math. Um, now, of course, you have to raise the money. That's the trick. You have to get somebody to say, I want to give you that amount of money. And you have to justify that amount of money because you've got to have a good forecast. Did I mention that? A good forecast with lots of assumptions and you've got a good use of proceeds for that money. Same kind of, you know, 
same kind of thing when you're selling a company and you, you aren't really that big, there's really no justification. You can't say I'm like so and so and therefore my value should be X. I like the 10 million in revenue number for meaning that you're actually globally relevant. When you're 10 million or more, you've probably sold outside of North America. Probably, not necessarily. But you're, you are in selling at a pace at which you're becoming relevant. And that's where growth equity guys get involved and, and want to invest in your company. That's where you can take some secondary if they do the deal. That's relevant. Anything underneath that, you really can't point and say, I'm worth six times revenue. It just doesn't make any sense. How are we doing? 8.30? How do you avoid the conflict of interest that an MA, an a advisor that's getting paid on the success fee is inherently going to have compared to the investors and founders? You know, you want to get the deal done, you're getting a small percentage of the deal, so a million bucks either way doesn't necessarily make a big difference, whereas for the investors and founders, it's a completely different story. Uh, well, we're paid on a percentage, so it does make a difference, like relatively speaking, right? But the... Yeah, it's zero or million. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, I will take your point on getting the deal done, right? So um, what happens is it's up to the board and the investors to get a deal done, right? It's not up to us. We present, remember the example? We presented it to the board. We said, here's the two uh, deals. We extracted as much value as we could. Here's the offers. Make a decision. Um, you know, that's... That is, there's really no conflict there because you've maximized value and you make a decision. If none of the offers are acceptable, what can you do? I can't manifest a new buyer. <laughs> um, now, where it does happen is when you've only got one buyer at the table and it's not a very good offer. You sometimes see the advisors go, just take it, right? Because they want the fee. Well, those advisors will not be in business very long. We have in a couple of cases not taken an assignment because we said we cannot get you that valuation. We can't. One guy uh, on a recent financing, we said we cannot get you that valuation. And he went out and he raised the money, but at half the valuation that he was expecting. I do not want to go and set expectations uh, and then not achieve them, right? So I hope that my brethren are like me and we'll just walk away. The fact of the matter is that if you've got a starving banker, don't hire them. It's not a good indication of their success. All right, any final questions or requests? All right, well, thank you very much for yep. sharing your, uh, no your experience and stories.